Ice fishing without a rod? Get rid of the windows in the shack, cut a bigger hole in the ice, and replace the rod and reel with a spear. We'll take a look at what you need to give spear fishing a try. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. In the Upper Peninsula, ice fishing is certainly one of the most popular pastimes at this time of year. And if you're into ice fishing, you've undoubtedly tried jigging, and you've probably used a tip-up. If you haven't already, you may want to give spearing a try. Here's a look at what you need and what you can expect if you decide to give it a shot. You don't, you don't have to have a, you know, a fancy wooden shack. You, you really don't. Uh, these pop-up tents, now that they've got, uh, I, I spear with guys uh, that uh, from... Uh, North Dakota and and uh, in Minnesota and and locals and you know the as long as you got you know most of it's dark as dark as you can so you don't have any light behind you so the fish can see the movement because as soon as anything comes above them and and moves it, they spook I mean that's just their their instinct so that's all you need or a teepee tent that you uh, those jackwart teepee tents that you see up in in Lake Superior the guys that are all bobbing lake trout and. And I've got three of them. I've speared lots of fish over the years, even before I built my, my permanent shacks. Cutting the hole, I've got a, an ice saw that, that I, I cut the hole. You make a hole with, it, with an auger. If the ice is 12 inches or, or less, you can, you can saw very comfortably with a saw. But you don't need a saw. You can take any ice auger and you could just you know, kind of overlap the circles and, and make, just make a square. The thing that, that you run into though when you get thicker ice is that you, you either have to take that ice out or you have to, to push it under. Well, that's a lot of weight to push underneath the ice. It's a lot easier to pick up some tongs. Every uh, spear fisherman I know has, has one or two. Once you cut all the, the auger holes all the way around, you put a few auger holes right in the middle of that chunk of ice and take your, your uh, ice chisel and, and break it up into chunks and, and pull it up. You mark your hole when you're done, whether you put all of your ice chunks back in or you take sticks and put in there or get some branches off, off the shoreline and, and mark that. You know, somebody can fall in, in that or drive a, a vehicle in it if it's, if it's not marked. And a spear, any sport shop has them, but the one thing I would recommend, you want to get a spear that has good big barbs right here. A lot of the ones that you'll buy in a local sport shop, they're, they, they, they put them on a, a, a bandsaw, a metal bandsaw, and they'll just they'll cut it in, and then they'll pull that out. And it, it doesn't hold the fish. You've really got it. You really have to, to, you know, to sink your spear into that fish before it, it holds very good. And, uh, and, and good spears are, you know, are, are expensive. I mean, expensive anywhere from $75 up to 300. This is a, this is a $300 spear right here. Your spear is, is as important to, to fishing or spearing as it is, you know, shotgun or, or rifle is to, to hunting. Look at two of them. Oh, that one, I, that one, I saw that one last week with the yeah. screwed up tail on it. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you in part by Blades Bait and Tackle, your hard water connection to Little Baby Knock. About 32, I'd say. The decoys, you don't have to carve them. Uh, it's your preference, but you, you can, there's a lot of decoys. I, 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 every time I go into Cabela's or, or any other sports, like Gander Mountain, they've, everybody's got, got decoys, and they all work. They all work. Uh, they don't have to be wood, and they, they don't have to be decorative. Um, 
and even if you want to take a uh, daredevil, a red and white daredevil, take the, the hooks off or leave the hooks on and just jiggle it. Uh, there's a lot of decoys out there that guys make that are just a, you know, a piece of wood, a flat piece of wood. And when they pull it, they've got different colors on it. It's, it's anything to get those fish to come in within a, the distance that you want to, so you can throw the spear and, and, and harvest. Decoys come in many shapes and sizes, and each fisherman will have his or her own theories on how picky the fish are. In Mike's shack, you'll find a variety of very impressive handcrafted works of art of his own creation. The UP is home to another master decoy artist, six-time world champion, Harley Reagan. Um, one of the best woods for uh, carving decoys is cedar because it, it holds up good in the water. It doesn't absorb water as, as much as uh, some of the other woods. Pine is a real good wood for working decoys. For all my decorative fish, I use tupelo wood. It's just a real good carving wood. It takes detail real nice. You can get your bronchial rays real good in here. It's just, it just takes really nice detail. And on the tail too, it'll represent the fins, how the fins look. The first thing you want to do when you start making a fish decoy is get a block of wood. The grain should be running up and down this way so you don't, so the tail won't break off. But what you do is you first you draw a side view and you make a pattern and you, you draw a side view, and then you draw a top view, and then you go on the bandsaw and cut them out. Now you notice I didn't cut all the way through that, because if I would, it would fall off and I'd lose this pattern, so I just cut that much through. Now I'll come back and cut the side view out. Then you can go back and just trim this up. That's your basic cutout right there. Okay, then what you want to do is you want to always put a center line in your fish to keep that fish centered so you don't lose track of uh, the center or it will it will just won't swim right. This is a Fordham tool and I'm going to round the back of this crappie off with a real rough grinder here. You just keep using that. This is rough and then you go over on the sander and smooth it all out. And when you're done, you should end up with a fish similar to that. That was all done with a sanding belt. Now on the head, the first thing I do is I try to set my eyes. Paint my own eyes, mainly because they're so expensive to buy taxidermy eyes. And you use epoxy uh, to uh, put the eye in also. And you can do things, you can position the eye different, you know, make the fish have a different look to it or expression or just like they do with taxidermy work. Use a micro motor tool. I try to get as much shape in there as I can. And I even have some heads here that I use for uh, models. And I just keep working on, draw, I draw on there and I carve in the, the rays and I'll just start making the rays on the fish. And then I'll split them as you go to the end here. What I'll do now is I'll cross hatch by hand here. This is just kind of an example. And then you I'll take a burning pen and I'll burn these scales on here. So you've got a nice scale pattern. You can buy tools that'll put these scales in, but I like to do mine because as you go towards the back, you can get smaller and adjust the size of the scales. You can see the, how that was, uh, the scale pattern on there is all done with lines and then burnt around each scale to make it stick out. And then you paint the edges of the scale, gold tip them to make them stand out. You've got to put fins in them to make them swim right on just a regular working decoy. They're plain and you uh, seal them after you put them in and paint them. A decorative fish has got carved fins. Just keep repeating that process and pretty soon you've got a, a detailed fin. Cuts the slot for the fin. And then you uh, put up some epoxy. You take some epoxy, you put the fin in there. Then you drill your holes in here, call it the lead cavity, and then you pour lead in those, and that's what submerges your fish. You want to start the lead right where the fins start and go back with the lead. 
Um, so the fin starts, let's start right here. So you drill your lead holes right here. And you try to keep the lead in the bottom of the fish as far as you can, because that, that way the fish won't get uh, tippy or anything. It'll just stay nice and straight up and down. You don't want it leaning in the water. You don't want it like this. You want it nice and level. And what I'll do is I'll hang different weight on here until it gets it just about right. Lift this handle and fill those holes with lead. If they don't work, I might drill them a little, pull the lead plug out and drill them a little bit deeper and go test them in the tank again until I find a, a good weight in there where the fish is balanced good and it swims nice. <laughs> Put a screw eye above the fin so when you pull on that with the line in the water, it'll drive that fish forward and make it look like a real fish swimming around. The tail is what gives it its turn. So if you uh, put a nice bend in the tail, so that, that'll make it do maybe four foot circle or so. You're sitting in a hole about eight feet of water, so you want a nice, you don't want a real big circle, you want a nice tight circle and uh, so you can see the fish come in to hit the decoy and they will too, they'll, they'll come right in and nail it. And I use an airbrush to paint just about everything. I make a lot of stencils too. And this should make it a lot easier than doing it all by hand. I get a lot of, as much reference material as I can so I make them look like a real fish, pretty much like that. What you usually do is I tape this right to the fish and then it'll stay down better and you don't get that fuzzy stuff. But this is kind of a dark green and that's a color that you'd put on the back of the crappie then. And that's the basic color and then you can go into that with some, well they make all different kinds of paints, iridescent blues and greens and you know, like this fish has got a real bluish green in it. it makes some really nice paints for, uh, for taxidermy work. I started out doing this and I was pretty crude, I made some pretty crude fish. A guy even came up to me one time and showed me some of my earlier fish and I tried to buy them from him because I didn't want too many people to see them. But I kept working at it and uh, it took me about 10 years to win a world championship. I started out at a, just making cedar fish and just for spearing. And that's, that's how I got into this. And I started out with some pretty plain looking fish and, and it just evolved into this. And uh, it just takes time like anything else. The more time you spend at it, it you learn more. There's different classes and um, competitions that we go to. This would be considered a folk art fish, and then I'll paint them when I get uh, when I finish carving these. They'll have fins on them, and they'll have to swim too, because they judge them in a tank. And if they don't swim, if they would say go backwards or something, they'll just get disqualified. It's a plain old cedar fish or a red and white fish is just as good as uh, an attractor as any of any of these. It's actually it's about the way they swim. Just a nice slow circle. You can work them faster. And you can paint them any color you want, you know. That's the thing about it that's fun. It's just, this is uh, what they call like a fire tiger paint pattern. For a working fish, you want to be able to put them in the water and just have them drive forward, nice and slow. I like them nice and slow anyway. And then if you hit them, they just kind of take off in a circle. See, it's forming a, this isn't too big of a tank and it's a nice tight circle. And they have to do the same thing for competition with a decorative decoy. You want them to look nice, as nice as possible, but they still gotta be able to swim. And these are really slow, or are, a lot of them are. This is an old fish, this is from 2001, so. This is the first fish I ever won a world championship with. I've won six of them so far, and uh, this was the first one. The competition is usually, swimming is about 80% of the judging. So if you can get a nice, slow-moving fish, you know, you've got something. And in the realism, too, the paint, paint means a lot. They've got to look like a, a realistic fish, as if they were taxidermied or as real as possible. And it's a lot of fun because you might go to a show and there's 250 fish entered in the show and everybody, there's judges, probably three judges at a tank swimming them around and, and everybody's watching, you know, it's, it's just a lot of fun. On, on decoys, you know, guys will say, well, you know, when they 
when they come in, how do they hit them? And it's any scenario. I mean, it's sometimes they'll come in fast and they'll just destroy the, you know, grab it and shake it and, and drop it and then come back, or they'll just come in and swing through it and hit it, uh, try to injure it. And sometimes, uh, you know, they just, they'll come in real slow and they give you a really nice slow shot on it. That's a nice one. No, that's that same one. Jeez. And the important thing with uh, with your decoys is that when your decoy is underwater and the fish comes in, there's no refraction. So the same the same size of your your decoy, you can estimate how big the fish is. And if you know the size of your decoys, like that's a 15 inch decoy, well, they've got to be 24 inches. So you just got to you know add add to it. <clears throat> I've I've actually have one decoy. It's in the truck. That it's 24 inches. I've had, you know, 15 inch pike come in and hit that 24 inch uh, decoy too. So it doesn't matter what what size of the decoy, but I prefer uh, you know more natural fish. And I like bigger decoys. You see, all these all these ones up here, except for that one, has has a tail. You know, and that tail gives you direction left or right when it's bent, when you put it in the water, it's going to go that way. With the articulated ones, the, the tail is, is moving. You can see the curve in the head. And so what happens is that water catches that side of it. So that's what you get to, to make your uh, fish turn in that direction. You, you spend hours, hours and hours making these, you know, the decoys. The amount of hours that, that you put into it, and then you see it actually swimming. And, and, and the best thing is, is when, a, you know, a, a pike or musky comes in and it actually hits it, or even comes in and, and, and swipes at it. I mean, you, you always have a smile on your face because it's, it's something you created, it's something that you've got your heart into, and it's working, and it's the satisfaction. And when you get, get to be uh, my age, there's, you know, it, it, it means even more, so. Oh, that's a nice one. Oh, he turned. 906 Outdoors is brought to you in part by Crist, your Northwoods neighborhood store. If you're spearfishing, there's a pretty good chance you're after pike. Another species commonly found in the list of fish to be speared is whitefish. <coughs> that one is stuck. You know, see how they can how they can go out? They're powerful there. doesn't get on. Oh, I got him good. He ain't going to get off. Tell the right. Now, there we go. There we go. And, oh, we go. Pike will, will come in and they'll, they'll hit the, the decoy most of the time. But what the whitefish do is they just think it's another another whitefish, and they'll come in and, and see if it is or if it isn't. And the thing I found over the years is that the fish are always coming in on a, they'll come in on the side. So most of your, your when you throw your spear, it's going to be on the side. So what I'm doing now is I, I'm, I'm putting the decoys, uh, one decoy out on either side of the shack. It's about five feet on either side of the shack. And lo and behold, they, uh, they, it doesn't bother them. It's maybe they think it's a school or what, but, but they, they start coming in um, right, right underneath the, you know, the decoys. Um, so it's, it's one scares them and, and you know, multiple ones uh, obviously don't. So if you can get out here the 5th, 6th of, of December when they're, they're right in the full spawn, you, you can see 100 fish a day. The spawn progresses, then we get um, 25, 30, 40, 50, whatever. It, it gets slower, and then right up till Christmas time, then it's rare that you see maybe a dozen a day. It's just the stragglers, and most of the time those are the males. So The other thing is you don't throw the spear. You put the head of the spear in the water first, and you just put it in there, because if, if, you, if you splash it in like that, before you release it, the fish is going to be gone. So you, you've got to put it in there and then slide it. Just take and hold your hand right here like this and then push it. You, you just push it. And, and the other thing is that when you've got the head of your spear is below the water, there's no refraction. So you're, you're on the same level as the, the fish is. So all you got to do is just, just aim. Like anything else, uh, a, a grouse flushes, you lead it. 
and if you got a fish coming in or going out, you want to you want to throw at the at the head, and the best place that you'll normally hit it is right at the base of the of the, the fish's skull. That's the smallest one I've got yet. <sighs> you can get into spearing for you know, if you want to get real fancy just by buying tents and, and things, uh, you, you can do it for probably two, three hundred dollars. A shack like I've got a six by six, the materials were about six hundred dollars. You got to remember, you're only going to do this one time. You're going to purchase one spear, so get a good one. And and there's a lot of old antique spears that are that are that are good also. But uh, you know, you're going to pay top dollar for antique spears because there's a lot of collectors out there. And the same thing for older fish decoys you're uh, you're going to if you get them up from an antique shop you're going to pay pay a lot uh, you know for them feel free to join us on facebook or visit us at 906outdoors.com thanks for watching and we invite you to join us next week for another adventure right here on 906outdoors mm -hmm.